Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me well? Yes. I'm Congresswoman Nidia Velasquez, and I represent the seventh congressional district. Welcome and thank you for being here tonight. Well, I want to especially thank the residents and advocates from my district who are here tonight. Let me start by thanking former constituents from Red Hook, Sunset Park, and the Lower East Side, to my new constituents in Greenpoint, Williamsburg, Long Island City, Hunters Point, Dutch Kills, and Woodside, Queens, who have been on the front lines of climate change. Your advocacy and activism has made all the difference, and that is why we are here tonight. In our region, over 1 million people live in the floodplain. We have worked on the federal level to bolster coastal resiliency to address the local impact of rising sea levels by authorizing the Army Corps of Engineers to study this threat and the threat of hurricane damage in coastal communities throughout the country. I have led members of the New York and New Jersey delegation in urging the Appropriation Committee to prioritize funding for the US Army Corps of Engineers to do a full analysis of coastal flood risk in the region and find solutions. There have been some budget hiccups, but the Army Corps study is back and we need to make sure everyone is up to speed and ready to comment by the extended March 7th deadline. The Army Corps is here tonight to discuss its New York and New Jersey Harbor and tributary study HATS and the tentatively selected plan for flood protection and what impact it will have on the Newtown Creek community. You will hear about a draft integrated feasibility report and tier one EIS or environmental impact statement. Like many of you, I too have serious concerns and questions about the proposed plan. I would like to know what alternatives there are to 15 foot flood walls on the water's edge? What options are there in the flood protection toolbox? The bottom line for me is that we need to balance flood protection with protecting the environment, ecology, and the public access to the waterfront. We need to ensure that the Newtown Creek Superfund cleanup is not compromised by the flood protection measures. We need to ensure that flood protection doesn't create a bathtub effect. That is, that it does not impede drainage of storm water and combined sewer overflow that can build up in and around the Newtown Creek. That will mean close coordination with other government partners like EPA, who is here represented by project manager Stephanie Bone, New York City DEP that is represented by Camille Derda, and Karen Ellis, Director of Community Affairs, and the Mayor's Office of Climate and Environmental Justice represented by Erica Jaswick, Senior Project Manager. As I already stated, there are many concerns, but let's be clear that these are preliminary proposals that have yet to be refined and developed, meaning that we have the opportunity to comment and influence the direction. The study is cost shared equally between the federal and local governments and nothing proceeds from study to construction without local buy-in and support. And it must go through the EIS and be authorized by Congress. Nothing can be constructed until the full tier two EIS has been completed and we are not there yet. So we must get it right. 
and getting it right means having an open, inclusive, democratic, participatory process. Tonight, Bryce Weissmiller of the US Army Corps will give a 25 minute presentation followed by 30 minute Q&A facilitated by Dan Wiley from my staff. Community organizations from both sides of the creek will have 15 minutes to make a presentation and the Army Corps will have 10 minutes to respond to what they raise. We will use the last 20 minutes to workshop writing comments on cards provided by the Army Corps as part of the public comment process. Tonight's event is also being recorded for the record. Now, I would like to call on my colleagues in elected office to say a few words. And uh, we are going to hear from both uh, members of the city council from both sides of the Newtown Creek. Uh, let's start with Councilman Lincoln Ressler. And I want to thank him and his staff for all the hard work putting uh, this event together with my office. Lincoln. Can we just first uh, start by giving a big round of applause to our Congresswoman Nidia Velasquez? I cannot tell you how happy I am to have the Congresswoman representing Greenpoint again. We we had her, we lost her in redistricting, and now through the redistricting process, we have her again. There is no greater champion for environmental justice than Congresswoman Nidia Velasquez. She has done so much to hold the EPA accountable, the Gowana Superfund. I know she's gonna have the same impact up here at the Newtown Creek Superfund, and her leadership on this town hall, I think, partnering with the Army Corps, pushing the Army Corps to help us get to the best resiliency plan we can will be absolutely instrumental in our community's success. It's also great to be with my other colleagues in government, uh, our assembly member, Emily Gallagher, my colleague, Julie Wan. Um, uh, it's fun to have Julie here from across the creek. Um, and I really just wanna thank our host, um, Triskelion. I'm a monthly sustainer. I hope you should be too. Uh, this is one of our great neighborhood nonprofit arts organizations. Uh, thank you for opening up your doors to support us. I wanna thank the North Brooklyn Parks Alliance for making the technology work. It's not easy to do a hybrid forum. We've got over a hundred people online from around the neighborhood. Um, and so thank you to Katie and the team at MBPA for making that happen. And all of our amazing partners that are up here, North Brooklyn Neighbors, NCA, Bushwick, the Friends of Bushwick Inlet Park, Hunters Point Park uh, Alliance. I hope I got that right. Sorry, I don't know Queens as well. Sorry, we love you, Queens. Um, and I, I also just want to give a shout out to Steve Chesler and Community Board One. His leadership on the Environmental Committee has been really important. And I really want to thank the Army Corps for being here tonight. Uh, they have been asked to give presentations across multiple states in every borough, uh, and they made themselves available. They briefed my office and Emily's office probably about a month ago, uh, maybe a little longer on this plan. And the thing that I really appreciated from hearing from Bryce, and I think he'll underscore again tonight, is that this is a preliminary plan and that he wants our feedback, that this is an opportunity for us to engage. So, you know, there are some things in here that give me pause and concern, but they want to hear that and they want to hear it constructively. This, they're not coming to us and saying, this is how it's going to be, get with the program. They're asking us deliberately for our feedback and input. And so, you know, 15 foot walls along our waterfront are disconcerting. And, uh, you know, for a community that has worked so hard to expand access to our waterfront, to create a dynamic waterfront, uh, you know, I, I hope that there are other ways. I'm confident that there are other ways that we can advance resiliency in our community. We are a waterfront district. We are, a, a, much of Greenpoint is in the flood zone um, and we need aggressive, ambitious, bold resiliency planning to keep our neighborhood safe from the threat of climate change that is all too real. And so we really do welcome the Army Corps' attention to our community, their investment in our community, their partnership with our community. And I hope that through the process of engagement tonight, through the comments that we all give from here to March 7th, that we can develop better plans uh, so that we address the, I think, gates around Newtown Creek that 
could cause some really serious issues of how combined sewer overflow might work during a storm when the gates are up so that we could think about how to protect the southern Greenpoint community south of Greenpoint Avenue and into Williamsburg that are not incorporated into this plan. There are many areas, I think, for improvement, but hopefully tonight will be a major step in that direction where we as a community come together to give that constructive feedback to move us in the right direction. And I really appreciate all of you for being a part of it. And I know Greenpoint is a community that rolls up its sleeves and makes its voice heard and gets things done. And I am confident that we are gonna have a positive impact on this project. So thank you very much. Oh, and um, it is my pleasure to introduce my colleague to the North. Uh, Julie is a tremendous advocate for environmental justice and uh, is really a fun person to work with. So for those Greenpointers who are getting to meet her for the first time, Councilmember Julie Warren. Good evening. It is so good to see you. My name is Julie Wan. I am the council member from the 26th district, where we also got Congresswoman Nydia Velasquez back after uh, redistricting. I represent Long Island City, Sunnyside, Woodside, and Astoria. I want to thank Hunters Point Conservancy, Newtown Creek, all of the Brooklyn organizations, as well as our community board um, two chair is here as well, Danielle Brecker. And I know that we had our executive board members here as well. And I know that we have so many opportunities now for us to be a connected city between the boroughs thanks to the connective tissue of our congresswoman and I want to thank Co council member Lincoln Ressler because he really him and his team are amazing they really did a lot of the work to put us all together which is not easy and I'm very excited to be here I know that this is something that we all care deeply about when Hurricane Sandy hit our district and our city it was devastating and all of our waterfront districts we know firsthand of how dangerous and how detrimental it can be and we know that last week it was 65 degrees 55 degrees and now we're back to 20 something degrees climate justice is a real fight that is a priority for us I know that with assembly member Emily Gallagher, Assemblymember Juan Ardila, as well as our state senator, Kristen Gonzalez, that this is going to be a fight on every level. And we are lucky to have such a strong team under the leadership of our, of our Congresswoman, Nydia Velasquez, who are here to fight for you. So I'm excited to be in support. And I know that we're going to talk about all the options that we currently have. And I do know that we're going to be hearing from our fierce advocates that are going to fight for flip up barriers, as we are seeing in Manhattan, that Brooklyn and Queens deserve the same of everywhere else. And we're gonna continue to advocate for that. So I look forward to hearing from you all and hearing from the Army Corps as well. Thank you so much. And it is my pleasure to introduce uh, State Assembly Member Emily Gallagher. Thanks everyone for coming out. I'm so, Happy to be in this organizing space in person and knowing that there's a hundred people online as well is incredible. More than that. And this I think is really the legacy of this district. And it seems the district to the north too, that we are we are bound together by our terrible environmental concerns. And uh, it has really built a community here. And we've learned that we really have to fight very hard uh, to get what we need uh, for our health and safety in this community. And it brings in generation after generation of, of activists, and it teaches us how to stand up um, and fight um, for what we need. So I'm really grateful. I don't want to list all of you again, you know, I'm the, 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 the back, the back end here. So, but I want to thank all of the advocates I see in the audience. I want to, of course, I am also thrilled to have our Congresswoman back. I mean, that was one of the rare moments in redistricting where we were like, yes. Um, and, and yes, I echo what Julie said with Lincoln. And I also want to say, speak for my state colleagues, Juan Ardella and, um, Kristen Gonzalez, we are regularly meeting and talking about environment. The first thing, um, that Juan and I did when he was elected was say, look, like we share the Creek and this is an incredible opportunity to have people on both sides of this Creek really activated and really working on, uh, this issue for the community. So I'm, I know he's sorry that he couldn't be here tonight. He had another event, but, um, 
this is something that we share and that we're working together on. And, you know, resiliency is an issue that my office is really focused on. And there are so many various ways that we can improve what um, the infrastructure that we have. And one of my bills, the Water Bill Fairness Act, <laughs> hopefully will pass this year, which is really about stormwater and um, and trying to make um, this just more of a regular part of, of our thoughtful process when we're doing city planning. So um, I'm really curious to hear what we're going to learn tonight. I'm looking forward to hearing uh, the advocates' perspectives, and I am here to be told by you all uh, what you need from me at the state level. Uh, and I will, you know, fight for the best option for us. So thank you. I would like to acknowledge um, that Senator, State Senator Kirsten Gonzalez, Chief of Staff is here representing her, representing her, Mel Gagarin, and uh, Kirsten Rose, Deputy Chief, from Congressman Dan Goldman. And we are just two minutes behind. So now I would like to introduce uh, the Army Corps HATS project manager, Bryce, Weiss, Bryce Weissmiller. And uh, no, I just want to say, I have known him for over 30 years. We have worked on the waterfront issues, Gowanus Canal and everything else, coming to me uh, uh, to make technical corrections, to work on the uh, Army Corps reauthorization funding and so on. I can tell you he has been an honest broker with you. Wise me. Thank you very much, Congresswoman Velasquez. Um, the presentation that I have tonight is a very short snippet of the presentation that we have online. Um, and I would just uh, wanna thank everybody for coming out tonight, uh, coming on the webinar as well. Uh, hopefully some of the information that we can share tonight is of use to you, but we would strongly encourage anyone that has comments or thoughts on this, please do get them to us by March 7th. I'll emphasize this a few times. That's when our comment closing date clo uh, period closes. Um, on the study uh, so we can kind of move forward. So um, greatly would appreciate it, all feedback that we can get on it. Next slide, please. So um, the HAT study got started back in 2016. It covers this entire New York City, Northern New Jersey, all the tidally affected tributaries, the area shown here on the left. It was started in 2016 with the two states sponsoring 50% of the costs. Uh, right now it's funded at 100% federal cost to its completion um, and uh, even though there's a dozens, if not hundreds of different things that have been done since Hurricane Sandy, a lot of the area still has substantial coastal storm risk. And that's the primary goal of the study is to try to figure out how to deal with that. Now, coastal storm risk uh, comes in a lot of different forms. Um, rainfall, of course, um, wave action. We have a lot of projects along the shoreline areas and Rockaway and such for that. Um, but then of course, storm surge, which everyone experienced pretty bad. So. Uh, some refer to us, our, our view on storm surge as being somewhat myopic, but that is the impact that has caused tens of billions of dollars of damage and has the greatest life safety threat of all those risks. Uh, so that has been a predominant pr uh, primary focus of the study so far, but that is not by any means the only focus. We do in, in value, uh, intend to evaluate a lot of those other compound risks from rainfall and other things as the study goes forward. The study um, report is on the website. The link there is at the bottom. Uh, it's a 500 page report, but there's a reader's guide there that kind of <laughs> can lead you through it, as well as uh, several appendices talking on a number of different topics, environmental engineering and others. Uh, all told it's over 4,000 pages. Um, so it's a, a wealth of information. I'll give you a, a short snippet of what the plan is, particularly in the, the Newtown Creek area. But as you can see, it's, it's a vast study area, so it, it has a lot of complexities to it. Um, next slide, please. So uh, as I mentioned, uh, this is our website. Um, if you go there, there's a story map uh, link. It's on the top there on the left side that is a much more visually based uh, uh, platform, GIS, where you can zoom in, 
on almost a street level view. And then also that reader's guide kind of talks about what each of the different chapters of the draft integrated report um, cover, as well as all the appendices. So the alternatives that we've been evaluating over these last several years uh, kind of span the spectrum from very large in-water measures, storm surge barriers between Sandy Hook and Breezy Point and alternative two, to only land-based measures. Um, and because there's so many tidal straits within the study area and rivers, um, it kind of begs the, the, the opportunities for trying to do storm surge barriers. So we've evaluated a number of combinations in these different alternatives. And the alternative that has fared best through that analysis so far uh, is our tentatively selected plan alternative 3B, which is a combination of some shoreline only based measures in some areas and some storm surge barriers. We have large storm surge barriers for the Arctic Hill and Kilburn Coal and Jamaica Bay. And we also have one plan for the Newtown Creek in that plan. But as the Congresswoman said, it's a very preliminary plan. It's very conceptual. And it's a framework that we have put together. There are a lot of pieces yet to be put into it. So the type of measure that we have, the layout where it is located, um, and then the elevation of the structures themselves are all subject to change going forward. And that being said, there's a lot more additional structural, non-structural, which means flood proofing and things of that nature, as well as natural and nature-based features wherever we can uh, feasibly put them. So it's a, a framework. We don't have all the answers yet but it, it kind of hopefully puts into place the large pieces that address the areas of most severe uh, risk um, from coastal storms, even given all the other projects that have been done. So uh, this figure kind of talks about the, the without project condition, which sets a baseline for our comparison in our studies, as well as the environmental impact statement. So far, we, as I mentioned, have been focusing largely on storm surge. And the graphic that's shown here on the left is the, the storm event that we've been using, again, to try to design features in the different alternatives so that we have a good apple-to-apple -apple comparison. Uh, so that's a 1% flood event, and we've also added to that the intermediate sea level rise, which basically would inundate all the areas shown in purple on that slide on the, the left there. Um, now, that's not the same water level throughout. The water risk profile, if you will, from storm surge is different depending on where you're located. Um, and actually, as it turns out, the East River around Newtown Creek is one of the areas of lowest flood risk uh, for that 1% storm event. But that being said, you can see there's a still a fairly large area because Newtown Creek reaches so far back into both Brooklyn and Queens. The graphic that's on the upper right basically shows a lot of the other projects that we've taken into account uh, as part of our uh, analysis in our without project condition. And the importance of taking those into account so we don't double count benefits, benefits that those projects are generated to, uh, uh, are expected to generate versus the benefits that we're calculating on the different alternatives that we have in our plan. And then most importantly, in terms of the long-term planning and, and building resilience within the city, the graphic on the bottom right is by far the most concerning and the most uncertain. Uh, that is sea level rise. That's sea level rise shown at the battery. The core's projections are the white, gray, and black lines on there. As I mentioned, the actual sea level, um, we've been measuring it uh, for the last 30 years. It tracks most closely, unfortunately, between the, the high and the intermediate projection, which is why we've been using the intermediate projection in our analysis, but we'll be evaluating for all of those. The colored dots that you see there are the two states and the city's projections over that time period, and they actually assign a probability to their projections. So thankfully, a lot of the higher sea level rise projections have a low probability, but um, it, just based on the last 30 years trend, uh, it has been trending between the intermediate and high, which is certainly concerning. And it's worth noting that, you know, you look at this, uh, you know, about this time next uh, in 100 years, um, you're looking at about eight feet of sea level rise. So storms like Hurricane Sandy add eight feet onto them. Um, it, it, it's, it's something that's best prepared for and done with, uh, dealt with now. And to the extent that we need to adapt it, everything that we intend to put in place will be adaptable uh, going into the future. But the key is just trying to figure out which areas um, and what type of approaches for it. So just to give a little bit of a summary between the different alternatives that we have evaluated, alternative two, which has that big barrier, has a very long time period to construct 
it covers a lot of the area, but with that 30 years of construction, uh, it counts very severely against it in economic analysis and at a first cost of over $112 billion too. So it actually, in our analysis, is economically infeasible. And you can see the other alternatives, when you start limiting yourself to, to smaller uh, storm surge gates, there's a sweet spot there you can see with alternatives 3A, 3B, and 4. And then alternative five, if you're restricted to only working on land, there's very little areas where we can economically justify doing uh, structural measures to, to address that 1% flood risk. Uh, basically a couple areas in uh, Manhattan and in Jersey City and the Hackensack Meadowlands. But of these, the alternative that has the least amount of induced flooding, that, which is to say the storm surge barriers causing some other area to have worse flooding, uh, we've put in measures to address that, but nevertheless, uh, the alternative that has the greatest net benefits has the least amount of induced flooding of those alternatives that have storm surge barriers and a number of other considerations is alternative 3B with a benefit cost ratio of about two and a half and a net benefits of 3.7 billion. And that's on an average annual basis. So we've done a tier one EIS. Uh, that draft is integrated with our report. Uh, it basically uses existing information uh, to evaluate the construction, uh, the operation and maintenance, the mitigation by all the different resources and all the different flood uh, measures that uh, are in the different alternatives. And it looks at all of those various uh, key factors when it comes to environmental evaluations, contaminated areas, obviously, with Newtown Creek um, and everything. But it is a, a very programmatic uh, a broad scale evaluation of all the alternatives. Uh, it's worthwhile to point out that this tier one EIS, uh, a tiered EIS is the longest EIS process that's allowed under uh, the federal law. Um, there would be a tier two EISs or maybe several tier two EISs, one for each of the features as they may go forward. And that's where we would get in far more rigorous detail and information to evaluate all the different cons uh, constraints uh, as well as refining the, the measures themselves and the locations and such. So this is a graphic that kind of shows the, the primary features that are included within Alternative 3B. Alternative 3B has eight main features. I'll just speak to them briefly now. It's got a gate on the Arthur Kill and the Kill Van Cole, a uh, long shoreline-based measure and storm surge gates in South Brooklyn and Queens encompassing Jamaica Bay. It has those three shoreline-based measures in Jersey City, Lower Manhattan, and East Harlem. And then it has three smaller storm surge gates on Flushing Creek, Newtown Creek, which we'll get into in a second, and Gowanus Creek. Uh, it has a first cost of 52.7 billion and an estimated construction duration. And this is assuming in all the alternatives that we have unlimited funding through that entire period too. Um, so it, it would take time to implement these things. And that, that construction period would follow after years of design. Nothing is gonna be put into ground tomorrow. As the Congresswoman said, that we're about two thirds way through the study. There's a lot more study to do. We assume there's gonna be about six years of design work, which is when we do that tier two EIS before the first shovel would take the, hit the ground. So this is a summary of that feature that covers Newtown Creek. Um, I do wanna say, not that it um, makes it necessarily better, but there is a mistake on that rendering. It is about five feet too high. I, I walked uh, that part today. Um, and I want to apologize for that. Uh, not, 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 that it, not that it's acceptable. If I lived here, I would not want that in my backyard either. But, but <laughs> um, the, the plan basically is that that area shown in green um, is at risk from that 1% flood event. And that's going to get worse with sea level rise. And that's just from the intermediate sea level rise. That's not the, the high projection either. So you can imagine how much that might make it, how much worse. But it also has shoreline-based tie-ins in Greenpoint as well as Long Island City, uh, trying to build off some of the, the plans and evaluations that the city has done, um, but basically tying off. And so it involves about three miles of shoreline-based tie-ins, and then it has a sector gate, which I'll show a graphic of what those look like um, around the mouth of Newtown Creek. Now, there are a couple points with storm surge gates. One is um, with the New York City DEP wastewater treatment plant, that discharge location might need to be relocated outside the storm surge gate. So when the gates are closed during a storm event, it doesn't cause back flooding in there. 
we've been included in all the plans interior drainage costs. So there would be pumping systems in here to keep the water levels within the creek low, which actually from a CSO perspective would be good because that would mean that CSOs instead of backing up in your neighborhoods would actually still be working during the storm events, which was a big impact from Hurricane Sandy, right? Um, a lot of contamination, a lot of upland areas that should not be flooded got flooded and th those waters went everywhere after the storm. That plant, not, the discharge might need to be relocated. And there is, of course, contamination issues. We've coordinated with EPA Region 2 uh, on that. Um, the area where the storm, or the storm surge barrier would be located there at the mouth, uh, that area would need to be cleaned up by the non-federal sponsor before we could do that construction. That's a core policy that we have. Um, doesn't mean that the whole creek necessarily needs to be cleaned up, just the area where the footprint would be for that structure prior to our being able to build the structure. So those are two big considerations when it relates to this feature. Now, when it comes to the rendering on the right, I, I mentioned to you there, there is an error in the, the height of it, but the locations can also be changed. As you get further inland, the walls can be lower because there is a slope going up. As you go towards wastewater treatment plant, you can actually see it's not in the 100-year flood event uh, green area. So it's possible with all that new construction that's been done along the water's edge, all of those buildings actually don't count in our benefit analysis as it is because they're built after 1991. So it may be possible to relocate a lot of these seawalls and elevated promenades and things to different locations or different type of measures. So just to kind of speak to the, the different type of measures that can be possible, um, certainly what you saw there was the seawall uh, option, but there's also elevated promenades that can be done along water's edge if, if that's the best layout location. Uh, and this is something we need to coordinate with the communities to figure out how best to, to measure, the, uh, uh, integrate these features into the fabric of the neighborhoods. There's also levees in some areas in our plan, as well as flood walls. Um, then there are flood walls with park. You can kind of see the flood walls behind with the park kind of low by the water there. Uh, and then we have in our plan, uh, it was hard to see on that first graphic, but all those little red dots were basically just different deployable gates for various locations where pedestrian access would be gained through it or vehicle access. So those are kind of the components that we have to work with. Um, and the layout that we have, just to kind of walk through it a little bit, um, the purple line there you see is a flood wall. It kind of tapers down to, to high elevation. Um, but then along the, the uh, water's edge, we currently have conceptualized a levee and seawall system going over to a, that flood wall there at the northern end. And then on the Long Island city side, you can see there's a, a, a levee structure. There's some seawalls. There's elevated promenade section. All of these features can change. The location can change. But the bottom line of what we're really trying to communicate is this neighborhood has unaddressed severe coastal storm risk. You probably all know that way better than me, having lived here. Um, we need to do something. Maybe the seawall, maybe the flood wall, maybe the location needs to change. But this is not something that can be addressed um, with 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 small structures. The, 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 the storm surge that can hit this area is substantial and we need to prepare for it now. Um, we, we certainly wanna see if there are areas where we might be able to do natural nature-based features. You don't see those in a lot in our plan right now because those typically work great, but they work for the more frequent type flood events and not the 1% flood event that we've been focused upon. This is what a sector gate kind of looks like. This is uh, from uh, New Orleans area. It was built by the Corps in 2012. Uh, it's now being operated and maintained by the, the non-federal sponsor down there. Uh, it's a similar structure. You can see the, the sector gates are basically those two pie-shaped uh, devices there in the middle of the channel for navigational access. Uh, in this one, it's 95 feet apart. Uh, the plan that we have has it being at 130 feet apart. This also has a couple auxiliary gates that you can see on the both sides of it. Those allow for greater water flow in and out um, for tidal exchange and tide prism. So it doesn't uh, cause um, uh, any kind of water quality issues. That's something we need to evaluate in a lot greater detail, frankly. Um, but 
uh, that's kind of what a sector gate can look like or could look like uh, along Newtown Creek. Just to emphasize again, our comment closing date is March 7th, and the study is scheduled to go until 2024. It might get pushed out a little bit from what's shown there at, at June because of the extended comment review period that we've had. But um, that's the time period, and that's when we'd uh, be making our recommendation to Congress. And at that point, it's in Congress's hands whether to give us construction authority, funding, whether the non-federal sponsors support it. And then that would only start the design phase that would take several years, as I mentioned earlier. So no, no shovel is going to be hitting the ground soon. This is a very preliminary, very conceptual, and uh, not, you know, it's a framework plan that we have. We have a lot of details left to work out. Thank you. The reports, again, at this website, we have comment cards somewhere. <laughs> um, if folks have comments, please write them on the cards and mail them to us by March 7th if you can. Uh, we would greatly welcome those co any comments you have on the plan. Thank you. Uh, so I'm Dan Wiley, District Director for Congresswoman Nidhi Velasquez. You may, you may know my partner in crime, uh, Evelyn Cruz, who was District Director here and still is, but she's just a little further south in the Congresswoman's District. Um, so we're going to open this up to Q&A. We have a half hour. and. Uh, why we have um samantha and marissa uh who are with the mic so just raise your hand and we'll recognize you for questions we'd like to ask you to keep the questions uh brief so we get a chance to get as many in as possible so maybe one or two minutes uh so we have a hand back there and a hand here thank you what is a 100 one, what is a 1% storm surge? How often would that be? If there's sea level rise, how often will that wall with just regular sea level rise cause a bathtub effect and affect all those other areas which do not have, which wouldn't have a wall to be flooding constantly? But first, what is 1% and how often would that be? Thank you. Uh, uh, that's, that's a great question. Thank you for that. The 1% the, the flood event is the storm event um, that has a 1% chance of occurring in any year, which doesn't mean it only happens once in 100 years. You can actually have a 1% flood event happen two or three years after. Um, but it's just the probability of that. So it's, it's a projected water level. It's based on a very vast amount of computer simulation modeling that the Corps has done immediately following Hurricane Sandy. Um, so it's a different water level depending on where you are in the study area, but the same probability exists 1% each year for that water level to occur. So in this area, it's in that 15 to 17 foot range. It's actually far worse in some areas like Raritan Bay because of its funneling effect. That 1% storm event is well over 20 feet there. Uh, so that's what the, that projection water level is at today's water level. As sea level rise continues, that means that 17 foot, say, water level is going to become 18 feet, 19 feet, 20 feet for that same probability. And if you want to know how probable it is that that 17 foot still exists or still occurs, um, that, that storm event that causes that uh, for example, Hurricane Sandy, for much of this, the study area, was around that 100-year flood event, that 1% flood level. Um, if you add three, three feet of sea level onto that, that makes a 100-year flood event more common to be more like a 10-year flood event. Um, it makes the, the storms will happen more frequently. They'll be worse. The water will be on our doorstep. Um, much of the city, particularly low-lying areas, are going to become a lot like Broad Channel has been for the last 20 years. I don't know if people are familiar with it, but um, a lot of areas around Jamaica Bay, they get blue sky flooding um, just from spring tide uh, twice a month uh, in their street and things. So we have a layered plan, uh, and the goal is to at least tr try to see if there's feasible areas where we can do th these uh, address the severe risk, but then also look at the risk from from rainwater uh, that can be coincident with the storm events, 
as well as what other structural measures we might be able to do for other level of storm events. So, uh, as well as non-structural and natural nature-based features. Thank you. Great. Um, our next question, uh, where are my mics? Okay, Samantha, yeah. uh, why don't you? Yeah, one right here. Okay, right here. Uh, Lewis, who I know is on the Gowanus CAG and the Newtown Creek CAG, so he's all over the place. But two minutes. Literally all over the place. <laughs> Not to mention the plume as well. Uh, first of all, Bryce, thank you. Uh, how often in the past has this kind of presentation been very opaque? You guys have been doing so much outreach that it's really a pleasure to see the difference between what's going on now with your openness and what has gone on in the past. And I thank you very much for that kind of a thing. Um, just a, and I've got so many questions, I'm all gonna keep it to one because after all, they are what they are. Uh, why is it that everything seems to be concentrated in the uh, built protection as opposed to green protection. Is uh, there a reason for that? Is it required by law or you guys just haven't gotten into it or just what is the- No, no. Um, it, it, uh, if you're meaning uh, green infrastructure, natural nature-based features, um, the NACC, well, sorry, I'm using acronyms. The North Atlantic Coast Comprehensive Report actually kind of spoke to this a little bit. Natural and nature-based features are great, but they only, typically work for like the 20 year event or more frequent storm events. If you're trying to hold back a 15 foot or worse storm surge, they will not work for that. Not that they don't have good application for areas where you do have those frequent storm events. Um, and as time goes on, those type of areas will become greater and greater with sea level rise. So it's, it's not an either or, we're, we're trying to advance all of them, but right now our our primary focus so far has been on the storm events that have the greatest threat to life safety, the greatest damage to overall property in the area. Uh, because frankly, the cost on those features you saw from those cost estimates, they're so huge on these different alternatives, one being over a hundred billion dollars. Um, we had to kind of figure out which, if any of those might work to then get those pieces of the puzzle together. And now we need to put in those pieces of the puzzle that get to those frequent storm event risk areas where we can do natural nature-based features or non-structural measures or other structural measures that might work for the 20 or 50 year event. Now, whatever we put in place too, and this is a really important point, we need to make sure that's adaptable over time because with that level of variation in sea level rise, whatever we plan for, um, it may be optimum now, but it may not be 50 years from now. So we need to make sure that we can revise it and increase it in its protectiveness uh, if and as needed for that. All right, let's take a question from this side of the aisle. Uh, Samantha, why don't you come down? We have Queens Community Board 2, uh, and we have Danielle uh, Brecker, who's the new chair of Queens Community Board 2. Okay, so I, I've had this, I've heard this presentation a few times, and I've probably asked the same question every time, and I have many, many questions. Um, but um, I guess the one I'll focus on is Newtown Creek. As you, everyone knows, they're cleaning up Newtown Creek. I understand that this cannot happen until Newtown Creek is, that situation is mitigated. I believe that's going to take a long time. Is that true? This, you know, and I have deep concerns that we're not going to do this and then we're going to get flooded and because we, we can't do it because of the contamination and it's just a mess. Like I, I just, I'm really concerned about what happens with that. And then the other thing I want to say to the elected officials here, this is as much on the Army Corps as all of you to please pass some climate action so that we can get stop this problem on the other way as well. Thank you. Good point. So the the transformational legislation that we passed, the bipartisan infrastructure bill, 
that has almost the largest amount ever for climate. And I We'll also make a plug for EPA who's here that um, EPA just announced environmental justice grants available. Um, so more on that, but Bryce. Cool. Um, to get your to your question, uh, the contamination would only have to be cleaned up in the area where the footprint of the sector gate or any other of the structures, wherever they're located, um, would, would be placed. So the entire remediation action doesn't have to be completed. Only that one area and the non-federal sponsors would have that responsibility, whether they would delegate it to the city, uh, whether the city is the sponsor for that matter, um, or try to get the PRPs to do that. Um, it, but it's only the footprint where we need to build our features, which is a very small subset of the broader contamination issue in Newtown Creek. And we also, we also have Stephanie Vaughn from EPA Project Manager uh, here. So if you'd like to say something. Sure. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, from, a time, from a timing perspective, um, when you look at the two projects, I think in previous presentations, Bryce, you've mentioned that construction on this project would likely start around 2030. Would that be a fair estimate? That's our assumption. There. Right. Yes. So when you look at the time frame for the Newtown Creek cleanup, we're trying to implement some actions earlier, but the full plan for cleanup is expected now around 2028, which means that, and, and that full comprehensive final um, remedy selection would include the lower portion of the creek. So the timing may work out that the cleanup of the mouth of the creek would occur prior to or at about the same time as the implementation of any flood resiliency measures. Great. Uh, let's t uh, Marissa, let's take a question from the back. You pick. Oh, great. Thank you so much for the presentation. Um, I just wanted to bring up the word maladaptation, the International Panel of Climate Change, obviously in the last reports has brought that up. And I guess, you know, this sounds like a huge investment but they're very clear in the sense that, you know, a lot of this gray infrastructure, um, like sea level um, levees, um, sea walls, um, it doesn't necessarily work out in that sense. So I'm just raising that concern and I'm just was wondering what safety measures in terms of those drainage options or when we've thought about rainfall, are you considering cloud bursts? So just wanting to know those concerns. Sure. Um, so there are a lot of dynamics when it comes to the other water risks that are out there beyond the, just the storm surge, sea level rise, um, which has a great level of uncertainty as you saw. And those uh, projections will be updated periodically as the science advances on that. Um, and we have factored in uh, relatively high rainfall events coinciding with the storm surge because Sandy didn't have a lot of rain, but I, Irene did. Um, so we are gonna be looking at that in more detail in terms of how much interior drainage type things are needed pump stations and the like for these various features going forward. But um, th there is a lot of uncertainty. So a lot of our analyses, particularly in the design phase, get into kind of the risk assessment aspects of, you know, how, how will these perform if there's a failure for whatever reason, how does that affect things? Um, the, the, the bottom line of what we're trying to say is in our, Tentatively selected plan, this area around Newtown Creek, Greenpoint, Long Island City, as well as all the way back along Newtown Creek, has a lot of coastal storm risk now, and we should plan something to do to address that risk and implement what we can that's feasible now so we don't have to go through what occurred with Hurricane Sandy again. And hopefully that works not just for our generation, but coming generations with whatever adaptation we need to do. Uh, and since you're good points, thank you. And, and since you're asking about um, drainage and and uh, and that kind of thing, we are joined by two representatives from New York City DEP, Department of Environmental Protection. Uh, we have uh, Camille uh, Dida, Durda. Uh, he's a project manager for DEP, and we also have Karen Ellis, who's uh, the Director of Community Affairs. They're both sitting here next to Stephanie. 
Uh, and we also have Erica uh, Joswiak. <laughs> <coughs> Senior Project Manager, Green Pointer, and Mayor's Office of Climate and Environmental Justice, AKA Resiliency. They change the name all the time, so it's hard to keep track. <clears throat> but she knows a lot about infrastructure. Any of you guys want to chime in on, on any of these as the local partner, feel free. Sure, I just, uh, we are also taking a very close look at this plan. We are working with all the city agencies to comment across all these different infrastructure needs that are needed um, as a part of the Harbor and Tributary study. Um, so we also share the concerns about drainage and the need to consider water quality. So um, thank you for echoing that. And we'll certainly be reflecting that in our comments too. Excellent. Now for the folks back at home, <clears throat> uh, we have questions that are being monitored by our fearless chat man manager, Isaac Blausenstein from Councilwoman Julie Wan's office. Take it away. Um, will the infrastructure proposed in this study impede any maritime uses of Newtown Creek? It should, it will not. Uh, the sector gate is designed to be 130 feet wide. Uh, and the navigation channel, we would not build it any less than what the navigation channel was authorized for that uh, area. So, no, uh, that, that's one of the concerns that we have, uh, along with environmental considerations and all the others, but yes. Thank you. Um, there's concern in the chat that the high walls will trap sewer water behind, between the wall and the community behind the wall. Is that a possibility with any of these designs? Um, no. Any um, potential bathtub impacts that having, and it may be something other than a flood wall, uh, but anything that would be caught behind that, uh, we have as a requirement not to make any of the drainage problems worse from our measures. So we would have pump stations or drainage improvements so that that does not occur. And it's worthwhile to point out that keeping the water low, because there are combined sewer overflows all along Newtown Creek, keeping the creek low so that those sewers still operate during storm events is a, a very um, good environmental improvement over having the storm surge come in and all that um, go out. Do you mind clarifying for all the Queens residents at home, will there be any flood walls in Hunters Point Park or does this study propose any and um, will they be a similar height to the ones rendered in Greenpoint? Uh, the, the elevation would likely be around the same, um, but then that structure height depends on what the ground height elevation is. That We refer to that as the reveal height. So. I believe we have a levee planned around that area and looking at that Hunters Point area, it looks like it has a fairly high elevation. So that levee may not need to be so high because the ground elevation is higher. And again, if we change the layout or the location where these things run, where it's further inland, there's less wave dynamics on it and the, water, the ground level generally increases. So the structures would drop down. So it's finding, trying to find that ideal location where we might be able to do these features. Right now, we just use existing information, very much a desktop analysis to lay out what type of features might be workable here. And a lot of that has been driven by real estate concerns, utility concerns, a lot of unknowns that we have. So we look very forward to working with our partners at the city um, and the, the communities to try to figure out what might work best here. Um, it's not that we're saying that you have to have that, that plug wall. We're saying that this region, so if people want to write comments and say, we hate the flood wall, but we recognize there's coastal storm risk and something needs to be done about it. That's a great comment because, you know, I understand that. It, and it acknowledges that these risks are real and these storms will happen again. And with sea level rise, they will be worse and more frequent in terms of how much the, the flooding that occurs. Thank you. Are you uh, do you have more or uh, uh, we can I, switch I, back I and forth? Yeah, we can come back. Okay, we'll come back. We'll go back into the room. 
Uh, so Marissa in the back, do you want to get the lady over here? And then we'll prepare for the next person over here. Uh, how about how about in the back? And then we'll come back to community board too. How about in the back? Okay. Hi, um, I have a question for you. Um, my name is Kimberly. I've lived in the neighborhood for over 20 years. And um, one, I first have to thank you, Nadia Velasquez. You've been amazing as a representative. You've fixed our schools. You've fixed the playgrounds for our schools. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, but uh, in terms of the water, because we are, are talking about things that are happening in the future, because we're still in the planning and the design phases, I'm wondering what all of you are doing to address the very real issues that we have ongoing and have had ongoing for the past 20 years where we flood all the time. So all of the houses that are sort of north of, I guess, uh, Huron Street, you know, are literally like seven inches above the water level. So every single time there is a, a rainstorm or a big surge, we have to be home to make sure that we don't flood. And it's a very real ongoing concern. And I'm wondering, you know, what are you going to do about the internal sump pumps, drains, check valves, things that have not been addressed in over 100 years in Greenpoint? And, you know, building a wall is all great. Building all these things that are external to the environment is great. But that idea of having the sewage water come in between the wall and the homes is very real. It happens all the time. You simply get one flood. And everyone who's in a building, everyone above, all the water goes down to the bottom. And if the check valves close, guess where that water goes? It goes to the first and second floors. Sure. Thank you. That's a great comment. Thank you. Uh, we will have to work. Um, hopefully, we can come up with something that's workable. And the, the, the study, and there's no guarantees, um, will advance where we can get into design and actually doing something that improves people's lives here. But um, we'll have to work very closely with the city with their stormwater collection system. Certainly, we, you know, there's a lot of uh, CSOs that will need to have check valves put in. But when it gets into the, the pipes under the ground uh, for the stormwater system, that's kind of the, the city's purview. Ours is to make sure that our putting a flood wall doesn't make it worse. Um, so that's where we have our, our, our pump systems and interior drainage costs planned, but, you know, to the extent that the city might have ongoing plans for how to revamp their system, particularly following Hurricane Ida's impacts or post-tropical depression Ida's impacts in the city, um, yeah, we absolutely uh, need to do more. We're, we're joined by uh, a state assemblyman, Juan Ardilla. Welcome from Queens. Uh, since, since we have Camille here, project manager from New York City DEP. Why don't we let him say whatever he likes to say? <laughs> uh, hi, sorry. So I do want to address that. Um, that is definitely a DEP concern. I, I don't personally know about this flooding. I'm hoping someone else at DEP is handling it. But if they're not, that's a 311 issue. This project is really not going to fix smaller scale stuff like that. No, I understand that. I understand your concern. But... What? Um, um, if there are locations um, that in your in your community that uh, are receiving constant flooding, please let us know. The department is currently looking and doing investigations of all of the areas, as uh, and follow ups to Storm Ida and Storm Irene and Elliot for the past couple of years. So we're looking at all the lo those locations that were flooded and seeing what type of technology or improvements we can make. If it's catch basins that need to be cleaned or other things that need to be addressed, these are all temporary fixes because we need the bigger project, but something that we can do temporarily. But if you have concerns and there are things happening in your neighborhoods, please reach out to not only your elected officials offices, but also to our offices. We have a community affairs line the number is 718-595-3496. Uh, I am there and we have five staff people that are there. You can call us, we have a voicemail, uh, email, please call us so that we know that these, these locations are happening because you may not be able to get through on 311, but reach out to us and also follow up with your elected officials offices because believe me, they contact us. So speaking of elected officials offices, and by the way, 
Um, I know the DEP is doing cloudburst studies in four neighborhoods. I don't think this is one of them, but I'm going to hand it over to Lincoln Ressler or to Emily. So uh, Lincoln and I have been really focused on this because of Hurricane Ida that happened right after uh, we came into office and we went firsthand into people's basements and saw just how disastrous it was. And I've visited folks um, off Franklin Street who, like you were saying, every time it rains, um, it overflows into their, their basement. And we've been talking with you all um, about this. And one of the things that we flagged is that I think it was just kind of mentioned, um, the green infrastructure's not, there's not one piece of green infrastructure that's coming to our district. And yet we are identified as one of the worst flooding districts. Um, and I think this is a problem. And I know that the source of the problem is the source of every problem, which is money. Um, but I think, you know, at the state, we're, we're doing our best with the CLCPA, but also the Bond Act. Uh, I know we have other resources. So we're really thinking about like, what can we do to get some money for infrastructure? Because the uh, sewer systems that we have right now are just unacceptable. So I'm going to pass it to Lincoln. Thank you for that point, Kimberly. We, you know, I think Emily said it really well. We saw when we went door to door across many parts of Greenpoint after Ida, that the places that were flooded worst are the places that are flooded every single time when there's a serious storm. And we need massive investments of green infrastructure and we need DP to prioritize expanding the sewer capacity and the catch basin capacity in our community to better mitigate when those modest storms happen. We know that for the 1% storm for the 100 year storm, although those 100 year storms are coming a whole lot more frequently now, we need to think about more comprehensive solutions with Bryce and others help. But to address the storms that you're experiencing flooding from on far too frequent a basis, we need the city to step up and make those investments. And with the infrastructure resources that the Congresswoman has helped bring to bear uh, from Washington, we should have opportunities like never before to actually make a difference in protecting our neighborhoods and prevent the flooding that you and your neighbors have experienced for far too long. And I want you to know that myself and everyone on this stage, we are pushing and pushing and pushing to make that happen. But please feel free to follow up with, with me and my team afterward. And we will make sure that, that your block and that your house is on DP's agenda and we'll do our best. Yeah, thank you. Can I just add that for Queens, for all the outer boroughs, right? We're seeing a we're seeing a pattern because Queens, for the populace and the density, we have had the least amount of plumbing and sewage infrastructure investments in all five boroughs, and it, it Brooklyn is not too far behind that. So we're also continuing to fight for equity, which you'll hear from all of our allies and advocates that will speak next that we want to see the flip up barriers that are being invested in for Manhattan, but we're not seeing the same investment in Queens or in Brooklyn. We don't want to look at the seawall. We want to see the water from time to time. Thank you so much, everybody. Sorry, I'm, I'm running a little behind. We were at the, the YMCA in Long Island City doing a town hall. Um, but thank you again for, for everyone for coming, for all the organizers, our partners, and for you for showing up for such an important issue. I mean, you know, when it comes to this, one of the, the key things, and, and at least when I was door knocking that came up were, were the ADUs. And, you know, we had this conversation where folks had a lot of, there was a, a contingency of people that were in opposition. Personally speaking, I, I'm someone who supports ADUs, especially um, now when we're seeing what's happening with the climate crisis. I think more now more than ever is when you need to see uh, take safety first measures, making sure that we are investing in infrastructure that can protect our neighbors, protect our homes. Again, and one of the things that I'm doing on the state level uh, is trying to introduce legislation to create the Seawall Study Commission in which the commission would uh, conduct an ana analysis and studies on feasibility construction um, of seawalls to ensure that we are implementing them along New York coastlines. Um, and rising to the occasion so that we can come combat the climate crisis. So whatever we can do, that's that's what we're here to do. Again, we want to have an earth that's flourishing. And in order to do that, that means that we all have to step up because it's absolutely critical. All right, let's take one more question. And then we're going to uh, go to community groups to make a presentation. There'll still be more time. Uh, so this side, um, Samantha, can you get 
or Marissa. Maybe we can get two quick questions in. We'll have both people ask and then a response. So Marissa in the back and then Samantha. Okay. Good evening. Um, so I just have like one question. Is the life cycle cost analysis for something like this performed? The way I interpret this, you will have a flood event or like, let's just actually change that actually. You have places which are already flooding regularly. Now you'll implement this, you'll construct flood walls, sea walls, levees, whatever. Now you don't have floods. Flood insurances go down, property value goes up, rent value goes up. How does this affect the people in a long term monetarily? Has that life cycle cost analysis been done for this? A project like this was implemented in multiple other places across the United States. I know last construction was happening in Middlesex County where I have friends and they said like, they are building these walls. And the narrative which was sold to all the residents was your flood insurance cost is going to go down and your property value is going to go up. How does this, has this been considered by, by elected officials? Okay, who, do you want to take that? That, that goes, uh, we look at the depreciated uh, re structure damages and uh, replacement costs and content, uh, but the dynamic that you're describing absolutely can and does occur, has occurred um, where there is those type of things. We, we, we look at uh, the existing structures as they are now. We don't look at future developments. Uh, we actually don't count structures after, built after 1991 uh, because they're assumed to be within flood code regulations. Um, but uh, just, based on our analysis, which was very limited, but it was based on a data set of the structures that cover this entire study area, which was a, a big challenge is to have a, a good data set that covers everywhere evenly. Um, it had uh, an annual damages in the 100 billion realm. That's how we were able to justify the, these large costs on all these alternatives. And that's just the existing value of the, the property. So. The dynamic you, you describe is uh, it, it can occur, but right now our, our assessment is looking just at the, the, the structures. That being said, though, um, we have looked at other ways of characterizing damages to the region and benefits. Uh, there's a requirement that we have to qualify, quantify all of the different accounts or registers that we have for type of benefits. These are national economic development benefits that we're looking at now, but that tracks very well with a lot of other uh, metrics, population density, critical infrastructure. The area is just so developed. There's environmental justice communities almost everywhere. There are critical infrastructure almost everywhere. So the metric that we've used here may be focused on this, the structures and re content replacement costs, but it tracks with all those other parameters. So, um, the dynamics that you're describing are uh, quite possible, but that kind of goes beyond what, what our analysis has looked at. Okay, who's, let's get that second question in really quick, and then I'm lobbied by the chat monitors that they have a long list, so I think we should do a bunch of those, and then we'll go to community groups. Quick, please. Hi. Uh, so this, this neighborhood was rezoned, I think, in 2005, and since that rezoning, uh, Hurricane Sandy happened, and since it's happened, uh, these buildings have started to build these 30 and 40 story buildings. And these buildings are building to the 2000, to the, uh, the new FEMA guidelines. So my question is if a building's built to the FEMA guidelines, do we still need a, a lab, do we need a wall in front of it? My second question is what do we do with the piers? How do we get access to the piers if you build a wall? Uh, second question first, uh, there would be, uh, whatever structures are put in place it's, it's a functioning city there will be deployable gates so that people can get around to to piers if it was along the water's edge or inland um, there are vehicle gates pedestrian gates those type of structures and there's also uh, there are a variety of ways of dealing with that um sorry your first point <laughs> yes thank you got it got it <laughs> um yeah, so anything that's built after 1991, we aren't counting as part of our damage assessment anyway, because it's assumed to be within those guidelines. 
So the damages that we have for this area shown in green are all the structures that are built before that. Um, and the damage that that 1% flood event can cause to those structures. So um, it, it's a substantial area. I think that answers it. Very good. Okay, Isaac, um, why, don't, why don't you read through a whole bunch of questions and then Bryce can try to answer them all in one minute and then we'll have the groups come up. Um, <laughs> you say during uh, design, the, the core would consider alternative locations. What would be the core's process for analyzing other locations for the seawall or other um, treatments? Uh, first off, we would... Uh, look at <laughs> there's a lot of information that goes into that analysis uh the utility lines um the, the geotechnical considerations and then of course working with the communities uh which given the, the vastness of the study right now it has been fairly limited unfortunately but as we get further into the study uh and particularly into the design phase i anticipate that each one of those eight features might be its own separate design effort so in that phase, that's when we get into that level of granularity where we look to see what is best workable given all those various constraints that, that exist. Um, if this goes ahead with only, if this goes ahead with only part of Newtown Creek being remediated, um, are there new obstacles to remediating the rest of the creek? I, I'm unaware of anything that would preclude any other remedial actions elsewhere in the creek by any of the actions that we have outlined currently. How will the plan address and manage discharge from the water treatment plant? As I mentioned, that's a major consideration just given how much of a discharge it has and that we anticipate that that discharge point might need to be relocated outside of the storm surge gates so it doesn't cause flooding when the gates are closed during a storm event. A lot of work needs to be done on that in coordination with New York City, of course. Does that change the area of remediation needed? Uh, I'm sorry. Does, does that change the um, the area that needs remediation? Would that change the boundaries for the EPA remediation? I I, I can't speak to what the the plans that EPA might develop for that area, um, but uh, for the area where the footprint of the structure would be. That area would have to be cleaned up. Okay, why why don't we now have the groups come up? They're going to change places with the elected officials. They're going to sit here on the reserve seating on the side. The groups will come up to the to the table and they'll give a fifteen minute presentation, and then there'll be another <clears throat> Q and A response from Bryce Weissmuller to their presentation. Thanks, elected official. You can sit over here. You're on the bench, you're benched. Um, hello everybody. Um, my name is Willis Elkins. I'm the executive director of the Newtown Creek Alliance. And uh, hey. <laughs> Um, it's really, I just have to say, it's really amazing to see electeds from both sides of the creek. It's been like a dream for many years uh, to have this become a more regular occurrence. I love it. So um, I'm going to kick off the section. Uh, we have a number of community groups that are uh, have submitted comments, that are actively submitting comments, and a lot of those are here tonight. Uh, we're going to try to keep it brief because we know there's a lot more room for conversation. We have Having Bryce in the room is is amazing opportunity. So let's kick it to the next slide. Um, we're gonna start. Um, okay, so these are some of the different community organizations we've been working with. And we'll start with Newtown Creek, right? So this is kind of the, the main issue. And so there's two different uh, comments. Newtown Creek Alliance, we've been working with a, a working group of what we're calling urban tributaries around the harbor that are gonna be severely impacted by this plan. So Flushing, Bronx River, Gowanus, uh, Passaic, Coney Island Creek, et cetera, because uh, we realize we have a lot of similar concerns around the city. And so we are finishing our comments. Uh, I think they're pretty much done now, but the drafts are available. Uh, it's going to be shared online and we have the print versions here as well. There's also the Newtown Creek, uh, the Superfund Community Advisory Group. I know there's a, a number of people here 
in the room tonight and online that are part of that CAG, um, and they've worked to develop their own comments. So major shout out to folks from the CAG, a lot of folks from LaGuardia College who've worked uh, really closely on, on developing those. So I'm gonna try to summarize real quick. You know, one of the big issues, and I appreciate all the, the questions about the creek and how this, what the concerns, uh, how these are gonna impact it. Strangulation at the mouth is a big issue. And this is a, a rendering um, done by a local architecture firm, Creme Design. And this in the same way that maybe Bryce was overselling the height of the wall, this is actually underselling the 130 foot opening. Um, but essentially, you know, what's really important to understand the concerns about remediation are, are definitely there. And that, that's, a, that's an issue. But for us more than anything, the exchange between Newtown Creek and the East River is incredibly vital to the health and the remediation of Newtown Creek. We have strong current flows that are coming in and out twice a day. And anything that's gonna inhibit the flow of that water is gonna have, in our opinion, strong impacts on the water quality in Newtown Creek and how a Superfund remediation is gonna happen. So as Stephanie mentioned, we're gonna have in five years, knock on wood, whatever, wherever it is, we're gonna have a plan for a cleanup of the creek. We've been waiting a rare long, really long time for this, but that cleanup plan that's gonna happen in five years is gonna be very much based on the exchange of water, the exchange of sediment between the creek and the East River. So anything that's gonna limit that flow is gonna be a major, major issue. And there was really interesting modeling done about a Verrazano gate. And you know that when you close it off, there's going to be strong current right there, but then the current's going to slow down further upland. So it's a, that's really kind of one of the main issues and big concerns in terms of Superfund. Um, obviously, coordination with EPA, I sort of mentioned that as well. Uh, CSO and stormwater, I mean, this is, I'm they're having a hard time sort of understanding the idea that just by when it's closed during a storm, you can just put a pump and pump stuff to the other side. The area that Newtown Creek drains is, is, hundreds of acres. I mean, it's, it's hundreds of thousands of people flushing their toilets, stormwater from the street. The amount of rain and sewage and street runoff is tremendous. And so the pump, a pumping system that is capable of transporting that amount of water from the creek, we're talking 11 miles of shoreline, uh, out to the East River is gonna have to be obviously foolproof. So is this system, if there's a power outage during a major, major storm, how's the pump gonna run, et cetera? So we're very, very concerned about the, the impacts of closing this off and how the system's actually gonna function. Um, and then obviously everyone else has kind of mentioned this last point, uh, focus on storm surge. There are properties along the creek, I see people here in the, in the audience that own and manage buildings around the creek right now that experience flooding on a regular basis during high tides. And we know that that's only getting worse. We've talked about eight foot, uh, rise in 100 years. So we need something that's going to protect these properties, not just for, for a sandy event, but every spring tide. So we're not like broad channel, you know, come 30 years from now. And he's talking about all these factories, all the industry, all the buildings, they need protection and a storm surge gate is not going to do that. Uh, we have additional concerns too that are, that are less specific to the creek, but more general. One is about the data being utilized, sea level rise. I don't really want to get into the specifics of it, but it's not the most current data. We have to wait for the most current data to come out. So that's a major concern. Uh, integrating environmental justice issues. This really comes to the cost benefit analysis that the city is looking at, or sorry, the Army Corps is looking at with this plan. We feel like it's not properly evaluating. It's looking at property, property evaluation. Uh, but we know that there are large communities that are being left out. When you look at the map, it, in, it ends in Queens, just south of the largest public housing development in the entire country. So where is the protection for Queensboro houses, uh, Queensboro houses, and how are these other plans that are, that are part of our mandate being considered as part of this? Uh, construction impacts, that's obviously very you know, obvious. We've talked a lot about that as well. Concerns about these gates being closed more, more often than they need to be. There's examples from uh, other parts of the country uh, where they're actually closing them more often due to high tide events. Uh, what impacts is that going to have? Also, when you have a system where city or harbor wide, we're going to have dozens of gates, the complexity of operating all these different kinds of systems, mechanical, manual, et cetera, is going to be very, very complicated. So uh, that's a major concern of ours. And then lastly, there's been a lot of work that's already been done by community groups, by the city government, by the state government to try and address uh, this very pressing issue. 
So uh, we need more incorporation. We need more meetings like this and, and coordination between the agencies with the Army Corps to make sure this is a success. So, you know, really the, the short of it is that this is a, on one hand, amazing opportunity, $50 billion as proposed to come to our neighborhood. But as all of you are aware, we have lots of other pressing issues related to storm surge, related to flooding that need to be addressed. So we need much more conversation. Uh, that's it for Newtown Creek. I'm gonna pass it to uh, Community Board One, uh, Environmental Chair Steve Chesler. Thank you, Willis. And thanks again to, uh, uh, to Congresswoman's office and Lincoln Wrestler's office and everyone for bringing this together. It's really important. Again, thanks to Bryce uh, Weissmiller um, for presenting again in the community. Um, yes, I'm Steve Chesler, the chair of the Environmental Protection Committee at Brooklyn Community Board One. Um, the, the chair of Community Board One is uh, Dallas Fuller. <clears throat> and after the the, uh, the Army Corps and the study team presented to um, our committee back in November. We had a hearing in, in January at the committee, getting input from community members, board members, committee members. Uh, I especially want to give a shout out to uh, Willis, who uh, came to the hearing and offered us some good, some really important guidance. Uh, Lisa Bloodgood, who's currently an environmental role in horticulture at Norfolk and Parks Alliance, Laura Hoffman, Trina McKeever, and again to the other, other committee members and board members who offered really important um, input. Um, the, uh, you know, uh, one, uh, you know, comment that, that came up right away is just the, you know, you know, we're, we're here at the end of the comment period, but people really took issue with the, uh, the time period that we, you know, we kind of found out, we feel like at the kind of the, the 11th hour and the, the two month extension was very helpful, but we feel like, you know, uh, more like a year would have been a proper amount of time for uh, an entity like a community board to fully study um, the, um, you know, the plan. But, uh, but here we are. Um, everyone agreed that, you know, the baseline is that, you know, it's not just, you know, flooding we're worrying about, but flooding from Newtown Creek. The, one of the most polluted waterways in the entire United States. And so uh, people fully embrace the idea of, you know, that we have to be protected from flooding. Um, but people, you know, really took issue, I guess, with the design, with the, the methodology. Uh, many of the points that uh, Newtown Creek Alliance and Willis have pointed out in terms of um, the uh, dealing, you know, CSO outfalls, it's over a billion gallons a, a year. Um, the, um, you know, tidal flow issues. And so we, you know, we just did, you know, didn't do a very deep dive, but um, looking, you know, really look at an alternative type of gate that'll allow a much more extensive amount of um, tidal flow to occur. We looked at the, um, the Thames barrier um, in Britain as, as potential. We didn't do a deep dive on that, but we just looked like there's just a lot more volume of water that's moving back and forth. And, um, you know, the gates fully move up and down. Um, the, um, you know, and then the other, you know, the part, the tie infrastructure, um, again, people really welcome the idea of protecting, you know, um, you know, a green point, but the, you know, the history behind the community gaining access to the waterfront, the water, the promised waterfront parks and the esplanades that are supposed to stretch over two miles from Greenpoint all the way down to the South Williamsburg shoreline, um, is, is historic because the you know, community the community board the community voted against the rezoning was kind of shoved down the community's throat and here we are we have all the developments um, tens of thousands of new residents um, and we're still you know we're still way behind in getting the open space and but it's you know it's publicly accessible waterfronted open space that people want you know it's it's the great equalizer so we have a huge issue with the idea of walling it off and um, we also just also question the the data. In terms of measuring elevations, you know what the current conditions are on the ground. We know that, like Greenpoint Landing, you know the 22-acre, um, you know housing mixed-use development in progress. They've they've elevated their their uh, you know to as high elevations as high as 17 feet and uh, 13 feet you know below in the parks. And uh, you know, Newtown Barge Park and Transit Park are, are prized open spaces. And so um, we really really urge the uh, the core, the study team to reevaluate, you know, kind of data they're using. Um, another area is the the end of the time of structure is supposed to go up Kent Street, cut uh, connect to a levee across Transmitter Park, 
and then up Greenpoint Avenue. And there's a parking ramp that goes into a, a new apartment building. There's seven businesses on the ground where the proposed flood wall would go in front of. And there's also a hill. There's a, you know, a steep elevation from Transitor Park up to Franklin Street. So we really, um, you know, and I'm glad, you, uh, Bryce, you mentioned you took a walk down there, but I think a site tour, you know, starting up in Queens and then uh, walking, you know, the whole um, target area, and the same thing down in, in Greenpoint. Um, and so, yeah, we want to really look at, you know, layered alternatives that can at least bring in, you know, a, a great degree of um, nature-based solutions or hybrids. We looked at the uh, financial district in Seaport, Coastal Resilient Plan looks like some really um, engaging and interesting um, design going on there that um, seems to have a minimal amount of, of, uh, of wall type of infrastructure. Um, as well as a living breakwaters project that off of Staten Island, where um, creating these artificial reefs that you know are supporting sustaining marine life, but they are ca calling uh, storm surges from around 15 feet down to three feet. Um, so that's that's the type of you know thinking and uh, concepts I think we really like to consider. Um, and then there's the uh, and yeah and the CSOs. There's you know the CSOs, the 13 of them in, in Newtown Creek. Um, I mentioned the long-term uh, control plan that's um, has to comply with the Clean Water Act. Um, that you know, it's it, will it really uh, work? Work uh, you know, reverse the potential benefits from that. And um, I would encourage you. We actually could use significant investment to get the um, remediation of that um, wastewater up from like sixty percent up to maybe closer to like ninety. Um, and, um, and then the unprotected areas, like south of, of Greenpoint Avenue, uh, Bushwick Inlet uh, floods horribly. It threatens the historic district. Um, and McCarran Park continually floods the former footprint of Bushwick Creek. Um, and then um, a Wallabout Channel down by the Navy Yard has the largest CSO outfall in the entire city, over 500 million gallons a year. And that floods. Um, you know, the southern border of community district one and um, neighboring community district along Flushing Avenue. And the, that's right in the middle of environmental justice areas. So there's an equity issue with um, leaving that area unprotected and also, you know, with highly contaminated water. Um, and then there's just issues with um, um, like, but, but, you know, you have undeveloped park land, um, you know, at Bushwick in the park, that's an opportunity where um, you know, there's some really innovative design there, having, you know, engaging um, uh, you know, parks that could be developed, parked there. Um, I know Catherine's gonna speak more about that. Um, and then there's, yeah, again, you know, what people have been talking about in their questions and their comments are the uh, non-surge related flooding that happens on a regular basis. If you look at the, the flood map of, of North Brooklyn and compare it to the storm surge map, the same areas inland are uh, flood, you know, like by McCarran Park, by Bushwick Inlet, um, Wallabout Channel, south of the uh, treatment plant, um, down moving down towards um, McGulrick. Um, so there's a real urge that we need a more of a you know a broad solution to deal with the, st the storm surges, but the the the, the uh, increasing flooding that's happening in people's homes and businesses um, as well during um, cloudburst events and. Okay, sorry, so I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up, sorry. Um, it was 15 pages, it crunched into, uh, yeah. So um, yeah, I think, you know, that's that's the crux of it. Um, the main, the final point is that um, the board, which unanimously passed this back on February 7th, um, is that a community task force, another CAG be created, that we can work closely um, and robustly with the study team to work out all these design details together because Newtown, the Newtown Creek CAG is awesome. There's a CAG at the, uh, the East River Coastal Resiliency Plan over there um, that's worked really well. So we we uh, you know, request that uh, that type of mechanism be set up. So I'm sorry I ran on. Um, it's a big district with lots of, lots of issues, but uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Elise Iberti, uh, Chair of the Steering Committee for Friends of Transmitter Park. Um, here's our bullet points, but I will go through them pretty quickly here. As you all know, Transmitter Park is a 1.6 acre park. It is a gem of a park. It's one of our only open public spaces. 
we're asking the core to please take that into consideration with whatever they want to put in that park. Um, we want to ask if the current plan accounts for park flooding during high tides and cloudbursts, which we've heard as well. Um, we would like to know about the wastewater discharge because there's a CSO uh, located in the park. Um, and then lastly, because most of the points have already been made, we don't really want that wall, although we know there's significant risk with this uh, plan and we know that something has to be done. So we're, we're inviting the core to the park to walk through it and see what, what can be done. So thank you very much. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you, everybody. I won't go through the list. Um, my name is Katherine Thompson. I'm um, the co-chair of the Friends of Bushwick Inlet Park. And I invite you to have a look here at the Bushwick Inlet Park. It's a... <laughs> It is a industrial wasteland. And um, just to, you know, you can look at our points. These are our key concerns. But I, what I really want to point out um, is, and you can flip to the next slide um, and then slip, flip back again to the old slide. There, um, the Army Corps hasn't talked about managed retreat at all. And that's because, um, Manage retreat is super expensive. It means like retreating from, say, the waterfront and giving way and not having more um, um, high rise development, for instance. And so that's very expensive. How do you um, buy that from back from, you know, through eminent domain or whatever, if it was worthy? But right here, I just want to point out on the um, Bushwick Inlet Park, right adjacent to the park, there's a 40, uh, 40 Quay Street, which is a two acre parcel of land that is um, currently up for a development and it is publicly owned space. And just wanting to suggest that maybe this space as it, an alternative to more luxury housing to the tune of um, like 900 units that that maybe this is an opportunity to um, to really incorporate this adjacent parcel to the Bushwick Inlet, which floods tremendously, and um, look at um, nature-based layered infrastructure response to this threat. Um, this park is in, in the um, in the pro in this. Uh, in the HATS proposal. So this is something additional. But anyways, thank you very much for your time. Hi, my name is Dewey Thompson. I'm a, a board member at North Brooklyn Neighbors. North Brooklyn Neighbors is a nonprofit community organization that focuses on environmental and land use issues. And I invite all of you guys to get involved with our organization and all of these organizations. I won't overlap. There is a lot of overlap in our comments with the others, but I just want to point out that in addition to the contamination that's been talked about a lot in terms of flooding on the Newtown Creek, and the proposal has shown to us, has shown how effective the barriers might be at preventing major flooding on the creek. The flooding, though, um, is not addressed in the rest of Greenpoint and Williamsburg. And as you guys, I think, know, there are many other sites like the New Hart site at Franklin and Commercial, the Meeker Avenue Plume, the fact that we did very expensive remediation at 50 Kent, where there was a manufactured gas plant. All those areas are also under threat of inundation by floodwaters and the impact of having floodwaters carry contaminants through the neighborhood, uh, I think has to be addressed. Uh, also, I just wanna say that the outreach plan for something this big. This is fantastic. And the, the local electeds and the um, agency heads who are here is amazing. But it's going to have to be much, much more thorough to reach all of our neighbors in an effective way. Thank you. I'm Jessica Sechrist. I'm the executive director at the Hunters Point Parks Conservancy. We can actually go to the next slide. Um, I'm representing Queens. I'm going to be quick, but Look at how nice screen infrastructure is compared to the walls. Just gonna put that out there, cheat a little bit. Um, so the main things we wanna build on what everyone else is also talking about, Hunter's Point South Park is designed to flood and survive. It was, there is an excellent exhibit at uh, MoMA's PS1. You can take the G there. You can see all these features. This is how we need to approach parks and waterfronts. And we acknowledge this is not enough. 
We know that there are other options that need to be done to fully protect the neighborhood. But this protects against 20 year storm surges. It protects against all of the rainy day flooding. It helps protect against a lot of the other larger issues we're seeing. And we do think that it is important as we are considering alternatives to look at options where you can build green infrastructure to complement that, to really, you know, to Catherine's point, there are spaces, there are public spaces that can become parks that are incredibly strong for this. Um, and they, you know, we want to make sure that we're focusing on them. The other, you know, for everybody, especially who's joining us on Zoom from Queens, because taking the G can be annoying, I know. If you go to the Conservancy's website, there's a point by point uh, list of the, I think, seven or eight different features that are proposed for the two parks and what our concerns are with them. I'm not gonna go into them here. You can read them, it's long, but I'm gonna be mindful of your time. Um, but the, the main uh, other point I wanna make is just, we are sympathetic to the fact that the Army Corps has a mandate that you are required to look at certain models for how you evaluate value, but um, pulling from the, the shore-based measures sub-appendix of the report, um, flip-up barriers, which our council member has brought up a couple times, they are described as for areas specifically where there's a need to preserve view sheds and maintain level and unimpeded access to the waterfront where it's essential. I want to remind everyone, so many of both our Brooklyn and Queens communities and our environmental justice communities throughout the city, we have been working for decades to right the problems of the past where we did not have waterfront access, we did not have public parks, and, and I do, I'm trying to be brief, but not not attacking the Army Corps. I just want to remind everyone that we need to not be making decisions that are setting the next generation up for having to fight these same battles again when we're trying to get back to accessing our spaces. So sorry, I'm recovering from a cold, so I'm a little bit shaky, but I just want to, um, you know, visit our website for the detailed concerns, but we just want to make sure we're setting a standard where we are really doing right by the work that's already been done in our communities. And we are creating beautiful green spaces that we still have access to so that we're not asking the next generations to fight these battles that we've been doing since the 90s again. Okay. Hey everyone, Katie Denny Horowitz here. Hi everyone, I'm Lisa Bloodgood. We are from the North Brooklyn Parks Alliance and we are so sorry to miss tonight's town hall but we wanted to chime in and share some of the comments that we've been developing over the last several weeks in anticipation of tonight's conversation and the March 7th deadline that we are all preparing for. Tonight is about the action that we need to take now, and that's really developing our thoughtful remarks and comments to the proposed plan that the Army Corps is presenting tonight. Um, many of you know the North Brooklyn Parks Alliance. We are the city's only district-wide Parks Conservancy, specifically serving the waterfront communities of Greenpoint and Williamsburg. We were formed leading up to the rezoning. Uh, the rezoning was a major community negotiation that included a vast amount of waterfront park development. Those waterfront park designs included resiliency efforts, not only in the beginning, but since that time, we've had major uh, incidences things like Hurricane Sandy and Ida, things that have allowed us to advance our technology and innovation in resiliency efforts as we approach coastal design. Um, hundreds of millions of dollars have already gone into our waterfront investment with hundreds of millions of dollars more coming down the pipeline. As these conversations and designs and construction projects are still taking place, uh, we are now presented with a potential plan that would wall off our community uh, to these parks we have long fought for for generations. These proposed plans also fly in the face of uh, not just our community's waterfront plan, but in fact, New York City's comprehensive waterfront plan, uh, which has been released in 1992, in 2011, and in uh, 2021. And in every single plan as it's released, community engagement and waterfront access are first and foremost priorities as we consider interacting with and improving and investing in our waterfront. We focused on six main points, including the waterfront park investments that Katie already spoke a little bit about. Um, as well as the inequity in the treatment between Greenpoint and Williamsburg. And Greenpoint stands to 
uh, be walled off or walled in with 17 feet of concrete walls, and Williamsburg is left to flood. Um, that inequity in treatment is unfair and unexplained, really. Um, we also included the toxic legacy that is this, uh, that really is under our feet here in this community um, with the brownfields and the super funds and on and on and on. Uh, it really compounds any flooding concerns that we have. And so that is also included in the letter. We spoke to Newtown Creek and the Superfund site that that is. And we manage a park under the K, Bridge Park, um, and that is right on the shores of, of Newtown Creek. And so that is also enormously important and factors into our comments. Lastly, and arguably most importantly, we included um, natural and nature-based solutions. And we asked the Army Corps of Engineers to really take a closer look and take into account all of the many, many co-benefits that they offer that really do allow for um, true resilience as in our communities and for our environment going forward in the face of climate change. Um, and for future generations, really, that's what this is all about. And these comments really build off uh, what our, our colleagues have uh, likely already talked about. You know, we've got uh, friends at the Newtown Creek Alliance and the community board, uh, and we echo the sentiment uh, of their comments as well, uh, because we are a unified community on this front. We all know North Brooklyn is a strong community. We're a community that is not faint at heart, right? And so... That's right. And so the conversation doesn't stop here. And it doesn't stop on March 7th. When, as we all know, the comments are due, right? So even after you submit your comments, this conversation is going to be going on likely for the next at least 10 years, 20, 30, 40 years. And so <laughs> we're going to be here the whole time. Um, feel free to take down our contact information because uh, our door is always open if you want to give us a call. Thank you very much for coming tonight. We appreciate it. Thanks, North Brooklyn. Get your comment cards uh, and start writing, and you have Bryce can uh, respond to the, some of these concerns. First, I'd like to, um, I, and I also, I also offer anyone who who wants to ask questions, feel free to ask the members here um, on how to fill out or ideas. But Bryce, please. First, I would like to. I and our team that are here tonight are paid to be here. It's our job, and we're trying to, to, to do our best in coming up with plans, but probably none of you are. So first, I would want to thank all of you online or in the room, and special, especially our community advocates um, for the input and responses that we've gotten and hope to get, again, by March 7th, please do write us. Um, our plan is very preliminary, very conceptual, and very subject to change, but it can only improve if you let us know how to do that. What are the important things that we need to take out, and what do we need to put in? Natural nature-based features. Love that graphic. Really do. Um, it's a shared responsibility. The federal government can do so much. State, city, local communities have a role in this. We want to continue this dialogue as we go forward. March 7th is our comment closing date, but it is not the closing date for when we start this conversation. It will continue on, as you as mentioned. Um, this is the beginning of the dialogue. This is the very first time that we have our agency come up with a what we think is a conceptual plan that might be workable for this broader study area. It's not perfect, but it can only get better if we get your feedback. So please, please do write us your comments, your thoughts, any, any information you can share with us would be greatly valued. We read every, each and every comment that we get. And you, and you have to respond to all the comments. Yes, <laughs> yeah, yes, <laughs> yes we do. So let's get to writing. Um, I think uh, everyone should have comment cards. The idea here is that you can put a stamp and put it in the post office or put it in a post box. Uh, but if you don't trust uh, United States Postal Service, I don't know why you wouldn't, you call our office. We can hand them right into the Army Corps. 
So the, uh, the, 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 the goal here is to collect as many cards, comment cards tonight so you can have your comments in already and they don't have to be perfect. Um, and you can submit it online for the folks at home. On the screens, you have uh, the online uh, information and more information online about how to comment. So thank you uh, for Lincoln's team for that great tools, showing people how to do it. Also a little bit of housekeeping, um, North Brooklyn Parks YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash at NBK Parks. That's youtube.com slash at NBK Parks is where the webinar, this webinar will be archived. So you can look at this again, review it. Uh, that will be helpful. Uh, and also, um, is anyone from uh, Lincoln's team or any elected officials like to say any closing remarks? And then I think the Congresswoman can say the final uh, closing. Uh, and, but, but right now, the idea is for us to uh, write comments and feel free to come up and talk with any of the advocates or, or groups or neighbors for any ideas if you have writer's block. I really just want to say thank you. Uh, you know, the as elected officials, we put our names on things, but it's our staff that actually do all the work. And so I just want to thank each of our teams, especially Emily and Hannah, Mariana from my team, Dan from the Congresswoman scene, Isaac, Andrew, all of the staff members who are here who helped make this a success. We really appreciate you. Appreciate Trisk for hosting us. Appreciate North Brooklyn Parks Alliance for making hybrid work. Hybrid is really hard and you got, thanks to NBPA, it was easy. Um, so hopefully everybody at home had a great time. And the Army Corps for showing up, all of our agencies, DEP, EPA, everybody, the mayor's office that are here, but most of all, our amazing community-based organizations and all of you, it is so important that you make your voices heard we really, really, really need you to get those comments in by March 7th. It's us mobilizing as a community that's gonna make a difference and shape this plan in the right way. And with the Congresswoman leading the way, I know we're gonna be in good shape. Thank you so much, Lincoln, um, Council Member Ressler. And I do wanna give a shout out to all of our staff. I know how it is not easy to stay up with all the chats. So I know that everyone has done so much to put all of this together. Thank you to the Congresswoman. Thank you to all the elected officials that are here on every level. And thank you to all of the organizations that are here. And I just wanna echo what Willis said from Newtown Creek. It has also been our dream to be in a town hall or in a meeting with every level of elected official from both sides of the borough, from Queens to Brooklyn, because we are just one big community. And I know that we have very much shared interests and shared goals. So I look forward to continuing to work with you all and supporting one another. Because Queens, we look at the Brooklyn side of Newtown Creek and we're missing out. And <laughs> we want some of that investment too. And we want to see those upgrades. So thank you so much. And I look forward to working with you all. You know what she just said. We we need more love from Queens. Um, but I do want to thank the the, the Congresswoman, uh, the, the the council members, my my colleagues in, in the state legislature, all the advocates, everyone, all the staff members for putting this together. I mean, everyone said what needed to be said. The uh, thriving New York is a New York that has a livable habitat, and making sure that we are addressing the climate crisis, working together to combat the climate crisis and rising to the occasion. No pun intended. Um, and we do want to work in conjunction because we do have, as, as Julie just said, we do have a lot of shared goals and shared interest. Uh, Emily and I were just sitting down talking about doing a joint bike ride from Brooklyn to Queens. So if anyone is available, I know Ron's just, just, yeah. Oh yeah. We got, we got, we got Lincoln in. Um, you know, we're very excited for this work. It's a lot of work to be done, but we want to come up and step up to the occasion. So thank you again and hope for, uh, to continue these conversations with you all. Thanks to everyone. And also it just, I, it's exhausting sometimes to see something like this and feel defeated. But so many of you in this room, Christine, uh, have taught me to never be defeated and, and that, you know, we can do amazing. Oh. Okay. So, um, yes, there's so many people in this room who have absolutely changed history and we can make what we want to happen here happen. 
Uh, and it's really nice to have the partnership of all of these agencies and um, the Army Corps, like investing in this together. So don't, I, when I saw that picture, I was like, oh my God, are you kidding me? Like after all of this, <laughs> after all of this, we're going to look at a cement wall, like, but you know, it's, we're going to, we're going to get through this just like we've gotten through everything else. And uh, we have a lot to look forward to. Well, let me express my appreciation to all of you for coming out. This is something that really impacts every community. And um, I just wanna say to Julie and, and, and Juan, this is the first time that a Congress member have represent both sides of the creek. And the state, and the state senator, the state senator, Kirsten Gonzalez also. So she's gonna be representing both sides of the creek. To the Army Corps, thank you so much uh, uh, for your honesty and uh, transparency and to really convey a message that this is just the beginning and that you don't have all the answers and this community is tough. They're not gonna let you have all the answers. And to, to all the stakeholders, but particularly all this community, grassroots communities, uh, organizations, you have been amazing. You know, this is a, an act of love. You, many of you don't get paid to do this, but we know that we have a responsibility uh, to make sure that our children will have a better place, that they deserve to have a better tomorrow and it is upon us. Thank you so much.